Hello and welcome to another episode of Five Things, a web series dedicated to answering the five burning tech questions you have about technologies and workflows in the media creation space, plus tech stuff I did and how it's used. I'm your host, Michael Thomas, and we're back after a mid-season break, ready to drop some technology on you. Today, we're delving into what you need to look for in a new edit system. We won't be covering Hackintoshes or low-level component builds, but we will talk about the things you need to look for when you're buying a new editing system. So let's get started. All right, so how many of you are ready to argue? Quite frankly, regardless of the information I share today, if you're a Mac person, you're probably gonna stay Mac. If you're a PC person, well, I suspect Bill Gates is gonna get some of your money. If you're a Linux user, well, None of the major NLEs or DAWs work on you, and you're normally relegated to high-end finishing applications, like those from Autodesk or Power Resolve users, in which case, this episode probably isn't for you. Your decision on your platform is most likely rooted in personal user preference or system simplicity over more black and white factors like cost. And that's okay. If you create all day, you should be comfortable and enjoy the environment you work in. I've got nothing but love for each and every platform as long as you know what you're dealing with. When you just mind your P's and Q's, Buster, and remember who you're dealing with. If you're going Apple, I think you know you're going to be restricted on your internal options, including processors and video cards. And you'll also be paying a premium for that Apple branding. But you do get somewhat turnkey options, which can simplify the buying process, as well as certification by certain software manufacturers. Most professional apps run on Apple hardware as well. If you're PC, you'll have a ton more options at a lower price point, but often you'll have to contend with multiple manufacturers to build your system and multiple manufacturers to contact for support issues if something goes wrong. You'll also lose out on some professional software packages like Final Cut Pro 10 and the ability to easily make ProRes files. The heart of any computer system is the processing power the system has. You can throw a ton of RAM and a high-powered graphics card into a computer system, but without a decent CPU, central processing unit, the system won't accomplish much. A vast majority of software solutions, editing or otherwise, will use CPU power first and only use the graphics card if they can. So we need to choose our processor carefully. Intel is usually the first option we look into. They have a ton of various processors. But the two families you're gonna to wanna to look into are the Intel Xenon and the Intel Core i5 and i7 processors. Of the many differences between the two camps, I've got a few to look out for. Xenons have additional batches of memory that are used to speed up certain applications. Often, and is with new systems, this memory is referred to as L3 or level three cache. This additional memory is much more than what an i5 or i7 processor may have, which helps the Xenons to perform better in higher demanding workstations. Xenon chips also support ECC RAM, error checking and correction RAM. We'll get more into RAM later. In short, ECC RAM can help prevent crashes and data corruption. Xenons also support more cores and multiple CPUs. This means you can build a monster processing system with more engines compared to other processors. When we start to examine i5 and i7s, things can get a little bit hairy. A basic rule of thumb is that an i7 will outperform an i5 in a majority of situations. Why? Well, i7s have a larger amount of the aforementioned cache than an i5, which will make repetitive tasks a bit quicker. We also have hyperthreading. That is, the ability for the processor to appear to the OS and applications as if there are twice as many cores as there actually physically are. i7s can scale out further via hyperthreading than an i5, so you can build a beefier system without as many limits. For those of you who like to tweak your systems, i5 and i7s support overclocking, so if you want to squeeze more power and performance out of your system, you can do it without paying as much. I5 and I7s also have onboard graphics ability, which means they can act as your GPU as well. However, their performance isn't nearly as good as a standalone graphics card, and thus we normally add on a GPU to our new systems for more performance. As far as price, Core i5 and i7s are usually cheaper than Xenons too. If we translate all of this data to the major manufacturers for video-based computers, such as Dell, HP, and Apple, a vast majority of these workstation options have Xenon processors. 
This includes the higher-end models of the HP Z series, the Dell 7000 series, as well as the Mac Pro canisters. Granny's doing the best that he can. I know, but she is trying to load the canisters. Could you guys argue without talking? To oversimplify things, GPU is a fancy term for a graphics card. Over the years, many editing systems have learned to take advantage of graphics cards in addition to the CPU. Why? Well, GPUs offer dedicated processing power separate from the CPU, which is already being used by everything else in the system. GPUs also have the ability to process certain things faster than a CPU, so why not use them? The two major GPU players in the market are Nvidia and AMD. Each of them has cards with a ton of horsepower, but the cards are only as effective as the language they speak, and if the application you're working with can speak that same language. <laughs> NVIDIA is a proponent of CUDA, which is NVIDIA's proprietary framework. Their cards fly when the host applications can use CUDA to communicate with them. And while NVIDIA cards do understand the open source OpenCL as well as CUDA, the performance between the two isn't on par with one another with NVIDIA cards. AMD cards, on the other hand, rely on OpenCL for the most part. As mentioned, OpenCL is open source and thus pretty much more widely adopted. If you've got a Mac, you're stuck with what you've got in the box. New Mac models, including laptops, Mac Pros, and iMacs have AMD cards in them or the onboard graphics ability that come with i5 and i7 chips. With PCs, HP and Dell both have options for AMD or NVIDIA-based cards in their systems. If I were building a system, I'd focus on what applications support GPU acceleration and then factor that into my decision. For example, Adobe products are faster on NVIDIA-based systems via CUDA than via OpenCL. Final Cut Pro 10 is coded to use OpenCL, and since most Apple systems have AMD cards in them, it's easy to see why. Avid has tended to rely on CPU over GPU. However, Media Composer does use OpenCL on both NVIDIA and AMD cards. I'd also look into GPUs that have at least 3 to 4 gigs, if not more, of onboard RAM. This may be tough on some laptop systems, but more and more applications are taking advantage of GPU, and you don't want to be obsolete too soon. Speaking of RAM, your system will need RAM too, not just for your graphics card. Your motherboard and processor will dictate what kind of RAM you get, and they'll also dictate the layout of the RAM, meaning what slots the RAM goes into, do they have to be run in matched pairs, etc. It is imperative that you match your RAM speeds, amounts, and manufacturers if possible. Mismatching can cause system instability or even cause the system not to boot at all. Most editing systems want a minimum of 8 gigs of RAM. However, I think it would be a bad idea to get a system with anything less than 16, and more like 32 or 64 if you can afford it. The basic rule of thumb is to keep your applications on your startup drive and your media elsewhere. Not only does this protect you if your boot drive fails, you won't lose all your media, but it also keeps the boot drive working with your OS and applications for best performance without having to also serve up media. Because of this, we can go with a smaller boot volume. Nowadays, most systems have SSD options, solid state disks. No moving parts means more reliability and faster performance. This does come at a cost per gigabyte hit, however. SSDs can cost 5 to 10 times as much as the same size spinning disk. But as I mentioned earlier, we want performance over capacity on your boot volume. Thus, go with an SSD over a spinning disk if possible. I know, not all of you can have multiple drives in your system, and thus you're willing to compromise. Okay, I gotcha. In that case, you want a hard drive that spins at a minimum of 7200 RPMs. Many desktop or bargain bin drives spin several thousands of RPMs lower, which makes video playback painful. Many of the drives also tend to spin down when not in use to conserve power. This is also very bad for video-centric applications. Western Digital, for example, tends to classify spinning drives by color, green, red, blue, and black. You can check out more on choosing the right drives here. In a nutshell, try and always go with enterprise drives whereas Western Digital calls them black drives. They last longer, spin faster, and deal with higher temperatures better. 
When we look at Apple-based internal storage, again, we're somewhat handicapped. Mac Pros use flash base memory, which is like a souped up USB memory stick directly on the computer. They may also have fusion drives, which is a hybrid between spinning disk and solid state. Both of these solutions are better than just pure spinning disks, and I recommend them as if Apple gave you any options. There's just so many options. For those of you looking to really amp up your system, you can look into PCIe-based storage. These systems run even faster than traditional SSDs. However, not all computer systems support it, so it's important to check with the computer specs to see if the system will even boot from it. They're also more expensive. More often than not, an SSD as your boot volume is a great balance of cost and size. Now, many of you will want to have additional internal storage, a RAID, and this is great. You don't have to worry about external cables and ports and everything is in the box. This is used commonly as a work volume or scratch volume inside of your computer system. However, when we look at PCs, most systems only support software RAID 1 or software RAID 0. While RAID 1 gives you a one-to-one -one copy of your media in the event a drive dies, RAID 0 gives you all the speed and none of the protection. These RAIDs are also done at the software level, which means your OS has to handle the writing of media to and from the RAID, which is why an internal RAID isn't always the fastest out there. Often, getting a PCIe RAID card to handle all things RAID is a great way to go. It takes the added strain off of the OS and may also introduce additional RAID formats like RAID 5 and RAID 6. I get this quite often. Let's see what you think. Personally, I'd go Mac. Yes, it costs more than a comparable PC, and it's a closed ecosystem with little internal expandability. However, all major NLEs and complementary applications run on Mac OS, including Final Cut Pro 10. You also don't have to deal with the ever-present ProRes issues. That is, ProRes can't be created natively on PCs without expensive software or unsupported workarounds. Also, although I am a tech at heart, a guy's gotta sleep, and buying a turnkey system just makes my life that much easier. Lastly, if I need to contract anyone to create on my system, chances are users out here in Hollyweird will be familiar with it. To be more specific, I'd go with an iMac for my type of work. While nice, I don't need the extreme processing a souped up $10,000 Mac Pro has. I'd also choose an iMac that the major NLEs qualify. That includes the GPU. If PC, I go with an 8 or 12 core Xenon based machine with a recent processor. I'd stick in 64 gigs of RAM and an NVIDIA GPU with at least 6 gigs of onboard VRAM if not more. I'd also put in an SSD boot drive. Of course, if money were no object, I'd bump all of those specs up. Have more concerns other than just these 5 questions? Ask me in the comments section. Also, please subscribe and share this tech goodness with the rest of your techie friends. Be sure to check out all the other great learning content at moviola.com. Until the next episode, learn more, do more. Thanks for watching.